everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be with you. I'm Dr. Natalie Edmond, licensed clinical psychologist and registered yoga teacher, 500 hour uh, pronoun she, her, hers. And I'm coming to you from my office in Ewing, New Jersey. I own a group practice called Mindful and Multicultural Counseling, um, which is really my life mission to bring um, accessible, good quality, affordable mental health with the integration of mind, body, spirit to the local community. And I also really love to do anti-racism consultation and workshops. I was really thrilled to see the response of people interested in this topic. Uh, I had over 100 people sign up and I know many will be watching the recording. So welcome to those who are watching the recording. I know that there is a lot to discuss. And so I plan to talk maybe about uh, 45 minutes or so, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions. There were really a lot of really great questions. Um, I know we will only skim the surface in this hour that we have together, um, but I'm hoping it is uh, just the beginning of a conversation. So uh, this is being recorded, as you know, um, so that others can view. So I will share my screen. And if I could get some head nods just to confirm that you are seeing um, slides, that is always uh, affirming to me. Yes, awesome, great, cool. So, so I really think of this as a journey. Uh, really a journey of anti-racism is really not, never a final destination, but really a, uh, a process. Right, it's an ongoing commitment to um, have this as a value. So I think about how um, we don't tend to see things as they are, we see them as we are. And so often um, our mood, our life circumstances, um, our identities, they guide um, who we are and how we see the world. So I think about when I'm tired, when I'm angry, when I'm feeling safe and social, all of those are different parts of me and I see the world and experience the world differently. So I always keep that in mind when, when engaging in this work. So there's this quote from Elvis Presley that values are like fingerprints. Nobody's are the same, but you leave them all over everything you do. And so I think of anti-racism as a value. Right. And I wasn't always anti-racist. And it was a journey for myself. Right. And so even though I identify as a black cis woman, I am descendants of parents who were born and raised in Haiti. And so I have those identities as well. And so I had internalized a lot of racism for a long time. And I didn't even call it that. It just was the way that I lived life and that I needed to do a lot of work to undo that. And I saw the ways in which um, only a fraction of myself showed up in my predominantly white spaces that I went to school in, that I worked in for many, many years, most of my life. So we all are made up of all kinds of identity, right? These are just some of the many. We could go much more. We could go into marital status, um, so many different other identities that we could go into, but to take a moment to just think about what are your identities? How do you identify racially, ethnically, in terms of education or class or sexuality, gender, age? All of this makes up culture. And some of these identities are privileged and some of these identities are marginalized in your individual being. And so to think about which identities do you spend a lot of time in, it takes a lot of energy, something you have a lot of pride around, or maybe some shame around. And then which identities do you not even really think about because perhaps you have some privilege? Because privilege, as we'll talk about, allows us to not have to think about certain things. 
So diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's something that's talked a lot about. And so what exactly is that? So these are just some thoughts that I found. Diversity asks, who's in the room? Equity responds, who's trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? Inclusion asks, have everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? Diversity asks, how many more of whatever identity you want to pick that tends to be marginalized? How many more of uh, BIPOC people do we have this year than last? Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as the perpetual majority here? Inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? Justice challenges, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views? This is from Daphina Lazarus Stewart. So something to think about, these questions that we can ask ourselves. So I like this visual that looks at how do we show up in spaces in our work environments? Just cutting out some background noise. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so, throughout the United the the history of the United States, we've gone through different periods of um, allowing people to have access to resources. So we had we started out with exclusion, right? That there were people in the inner circle and everybody else. And, you know, that often the people excluded were people who didn't identify as, let's say, white, or to be more specific, a particular kind of European. So that excluded people who weren't considered white, right, which could have been Jewish people, Irish people, Italian people. It certainly excluded uh, the indigenous people of the United States. And I often think about honoring the land that we're in. So I'm in New Jersey, so that's the Lenny Lenape people, right? That this was their land and that was stolen from them. And then we have uh, the enslaved black people, but they were excluded. And then we had a period of segregation where there was this idea that there could be equal but yet separate access to resources. And then we had integration, which was we want to include people more, but we still want them to kind of be separate. Um, for, you know, in the very beginning of the United States, assimilation was a very big deal, which, you know, continues even to today, right? Assimilation is you're welcome here as long as you adapt to our norms, our rules, our culture. And, you're, and so more people are similar than different. And then true inclusion is that people's full selves can show up in the space. So if we think about that in terms of your organization, which one of these is actually true, right? And I think a true anti-racist organization or culture challenges assimilation, right? Because assimilation is the culture of politeness, right? It's not saying that people's full self can show up. So I invite you to think about for yourself, for whatever setting that you're coming from, because we have a wide variety of people signed up here in terms of school settings and yoga studios and group practices and nonprofits and small businesses. There are so many different places. What parts of yourself are seen and visible and what are invisible? What do you wish was seen? What parts of yourself do you leave at the door? What would need to change at work for people to bring more of their full self? Do you have a culture of politeness at your work? So that conflict really isn't addressed 
different ideas, opinions aren't welcomed. They might even be subtly or not so subtly punished. How is difference of opinion celebrated? What is considered professional? Who defines what that is? Does whiteness have a culture? So I think so often in this anti-racism work, we have a very binary view of what racism is. You're either racist and you're bad, or you're not racist and you're good. But I invite you to challenge that notion that racism really is a continuum. Racism operates on an individual level and it operates on a systemic institutional level. So each of us as individuals have power to be anti-racist or to be not racist, which are two very different things. Not racist is a passive, just no, 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 that doesn't apply to me. But anti-racist is, is active energy that's put into naming things that tend to be invisible, really trying to make reparations, to really try to have equity and justice. So most of us are not racist. Anti-racism, that's an active choice. And all of us have biases, right? Not all of us have power as a group, but we do as individuals. And some of us have more responsibility for change because of the privilege that we hold and carry. So I like this quote from Chris Rock. The thing is, we treat racism in this country like it's a style that America went through. Like flared legs and lava lamps. Oh, that crazy thing we did, we were hanging black people. We treat it like a fad instead of a disease that eradicates millions of people. You've got to get it at a lab and study it and see its origins and see what it's immune to and what breaks it down. I think that there has been this awakening this year for some people. Other people always knew this to be true. That COVID disproportionately is killing communities of color, particularly black and brown communities. And part of that is the legacy of systemic racism, of exclusion, which makes them more vulnerable in terms of the jobs that they have, the places they live. That privilege allows people to be protected in ways. So the ability to be able to work remotely, the ability to live in homes in, in suburban areas where there's more space between people, it's easier to do social distancing in those ways. And then also seeing the ability to have cameras and videos to show the long legacy of police brutality. So what are we gonna do with this awakening, with this momentum? So white supremacy is a term that in many ways is equivalent to institutional racism, and yet I feel like it more adequately describes the foundation of anti-racism work. And for a long time, I would cringe when I heard the word white supremacy because I imagined it as these people or these groups who just were so overtly racist you know, the KKK and other white nationalist groups. But really, really white supremacy is a network. It's the foundation of the United States where whiteness was seen as superior and a certain kind of whiteness was seen as superior. And the United States was founded on this system. Other, some of you have been to some of my workshops where we dive much more into this than we will today that if we think about our forefathers, they embody particular characteristics that, that really identify what white supremacy is. So that is white, cis, meaning that is their sex assigned at birth, is the same as their gender. So male, heterosexual, Christian, educated, upper class, able-bodied, and everything else is inferior. And over time, that whiteness gets expanded, right? So that there were certain ethnic groups that were excluded from this white privilege, which comes from white supremacy and eventually were included as white 
and all the privileges that come with that. So this white supremacy then becomes part of the system, the legal system, the economic system, the cultural system, the political system. And then it leads to disparities. And part of white supremacy is anti-blackness culture. So anti-blackness culture started with the enslavement of black people for hundreds of years. And then even when there was the abolishment of slavery, there were laws put in place and lynching began, segregation, Jim Crow laws to keep it so that black people still didn't have access to the same resources, the ability to vote, to have land, to have edu equal access to education and housing, even access to farms. There was no real reparation that lasted more than a year. So all of that continue, has a legacy today. So I often use this chart to talk about white supremacy because it can be really hard to wrap one's head around white supremacy and how pervasive it is. We have to understand that in order to be anti-racist ourselves and to be an anti-racist organization. So when we look at white supremacy, we tend to think of it as the top of the pyramid, these overt acts of racism, of what people call hatred, hate crimes, mass murders, lynching, right? That white supremacy was, it was the enslavement of various types of people. And then in the middle of the pyramid, we see all the ways it got institutionalized. So when I think of things being institutionalized, I think about policies that are created by people in power that then everyday people enforce. So redlining, right? That was done in the 1900s where certain neighborhoods had more, um, certain people could buy homes there and could live there. White people could, particularly suburbs. And so that, along with um, not being able to access the GI Bill benefits, not being able to access the same um, interest loans or, or get loans from banks, um, all of the not being able to be hired for jobs, um, racial profiling, all those kinds of things, they created an imbalance, right? Because white households were able to build wealth for generations. And so that's the institutional stuff. And if we look at various different city maps, we see the segregation. We see where certain neighborhoods are predominantly white and others are predominantly uh, BIPOC. Uh, black, indigenous, people of color. And, <clears throat> and that impacts all kinds of things like um, school districts and access to resources. Um, some communities are over police, some communities are under police. We have a Eurocentric curriculum that starts to be like veiled racism. So we don't even learn this history of, of what really happened in the United States. We hear it from one lens. Colorblindness and tokenism, right? That these are racist ideas because they don't allow one's full humanity to be seen. Racist mascots. And all the ways we minimize white supremacy, not challenging racist jokes, thinking that just because we have one or two BIPOC individuals in our organization that that means we're anti-racist. But what does that mean for one or two people to be in predominantly white spaces? And the stress that that takes on them to navigate all the biases that are ingrained in so many of us. And at the bottom of this pyramid is indifference. Being a political, um, just because um, different laws and policies don't immediately impact your household or you, that perhaps there is an energy, there isn't even an awareness of what's going on. And that bottom of the pyramid, that indifference and that minimization, being a, a rescuer as a white person, those are things that perpetuate and are complicit and hold up white supremacy. So that the people who are viewed as white supremacists, if they no longer existed or, or let go of those ideas, 
white supremacy would persist because it is so built into everything, into our culture. So I find this pyramid hopeful because it helps us see that at the bottom of the pyramid, the widest of the base, there is so much opportunity on a daily basis to be anti-racist and allow the pyramid to start to crumble. This is just a different version of the pyramid, which shows overt white supremacy, which tends to be socially unacceptable, and yet has really come to the surface in the last couple of years. And we have covert white supremacy, which is most of white supremacy, and that tends to be socially acceptable. I'll just name a few things, right? All lives matter. Make America great again. White silence calling the police on black people, not acknowledging the history of slave patrols, which is how the police system was formed in the 1800s, which was designed to police and capture runaway slaves. So that was always the history of this, not friendship between black people and police departments. The way that we self-segregate into different neighborhoods, into different school districts, so we really don't even get to have a mixed group of friends and acquaintances. Microaggressions such as you are so articulate, which implies that I did not expect that from someone in that body. The celebration of Columbus Day, this idea of meritocracy, that people can achieve the American dream if they just work hard enough, which doesn't take into account the history of racism and the history of white people having a head start. There's too much blaming of the individual versus looking at systemic issues. So many of you have seen some variation of this iceberg theory of culture, which is this idea that at the very top of the, of the iceberg is what's visible as like culture values. And this happens in our, in our school districts, this happens in our workplaces. And then underneath the iceberg which is most right like there's the conscious part and then there's so much below the surface that that we're not aware of right and that yet that guides so much of what happens in the circles and arenas that we work in the ways in which communication happens gender roles uh, eye contact how decisions are made um, cooperation versus competition, what's the culture, the ways in which we solve problems, what we wear, uh, conversational patterns, all of that is unconscious. And yet it guides so much of our life and our behaviors. So we have all these things, right? We see the pyramid, white supremacy pyramid. We see this cultural iceberg where we have so much stuff that's unconscious. And to be anti-racist, we have to bring that unconscious stuff to be conscious. Because otherwise, our brain is this wonderful organ that likes to simplify things. It likes a binary system. It likes, um, it defaults to negativity bias. It's very self-centered, right? Um, and by self-centered, I mean it's all about me, 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 right? I'm trying to survive. I'm just trying to take care of myself. And often we operate from this place of scarcity. So we have stereotypes, which is our brain's way of identifying like ideas about people, right? And some of it is based in truth, but then it gets distorted. And we think it applies for a whole group of people that identify in a particular way. We have implicit bias, which is subconscious attitudes, perceptions, and stereotypes that influence our understanding, actions, and behavior when interacting with various identities. We have microaggressions, which are the subtle verbal or nonverbal insults, indignities, or denigrating messages directed toward an individual due to their marginalized identity, often committed by well-intentioned people who are unaware of the hidden messages conveyed or the impact of their statements. And yet, those microaggressions, they hurt. Many people call it, it's like death by a thousand little cuts. Sometimes when you're experiencing those microaggressions, you doubt yourself like did i just hear that did that person just do that am i making too big of a deal of things and if that's happening on a daily basis for you the energy that's not available to you 
to do other things. So microaggression causes stress. And we see it biologically with our stress response. We see the emotional impact, the built up anger and frustration and fatigue, um, the sadness that can come up, the ways in which it can impact one's cognitive ability. So there's a notion called stereotype threat, which is this idea that when we have stereotypes about people, you know, people who tend to be in marginalized groups, groups or the, or in the oppressed groups, they tend to, because it helps them to survive, have a better sense of what those stereotypes are. They have a better sense of like who has power and who doesn't because they need that in order to survive. So there, there's cognitive processing that's focused on that, that could decrease focus and productivity because when you're, when you're in a stress response, you're just trying to survive. It's harder to access that other stuff, that higher order thinking or you just have to work harder for that, which also is stressful on the body. But stereotype threat is this idea that when you have that stereotype about a person, so let's say, you know, for gender, if we say that women um, tend to be not good at math and sciences, at some point, girls start to believe that. And then they start to underperform in that arena related to math and science, right? And so we can say that about racial things, right? That if there's a stereotype threat about Black people um, are lazy or they're, or they're not very articulate, they're not good readers, then, then that person who identifies as Black then tends to underperform on standardized testing and other kinds of tests. And it doesn't truly measure their ability. It's that stereotype threat. So we don't really get to see what their true potential is. So when I think about race, and structural racism and who's affected, I see everybody is affected. Absolutely everybody. Because it's everywhere, whether it's explicit or implicit. So many of you could be thinking, well, I'm not overtly racist. Uh, I'm a nice person. I have a um, diverse group of friends, right? And even that notion of diverse, right? Diverse from what, right? So we all know that there's a standard, right? It's diverse from whiteness, right? And so how do we start to deconstruct that stuff that is so familiar to us? So many of us work in places where white supremacy is the culture. We live in a white supremacist culture. And so these are some of the values that white supremacy culture um, really embodies, which is perfectionism. How many people maybe yourself included, strive for perfection and all the stress and busyness that comes with that. There's a sense of urgency, right? That emails have to be returned quickly and um, texts have to be returned quickly. The projects have to be done soon. I have to like achieve all my goals really quickly. There's a defensiveness, right? It's hard to just have humility, to just own up to things quantity over quality. It's how much you can produce, not how, what's the quality of what you're producing. Worship of the written word. If it's not in writing, if it hasn't been well researched, I don't believe it. This paternalistic, top-down kind of approach, either or thinking or binary thinking, objectivity versus subjectivity. I want to feel comfortable. I don't want to be in conflict with people. Capitalism, power hoarding, right? That scarcity mindset and the focus on the individual versus the community. So this is the air that we breathe. And so being working towards becoming an anti-racist organization is starting to challenge these values and ideas. Right, so this idea of like, maybe I really take the whole weekend off. Maybe I don't respond to emails after a certain time. Maybe I don't blast someone because I didn't get a response within a couple of hours. Maybe I actually take time to rest. And I encourage my employees, my colleagues to rest as well. Because rest is resistance. Rest is a challenge to white supremacy culture. 
if we embrace an attitude of abundance that there's enough here for all of us and we embodied that how different things would be if we really believe that the most vulnerable among us need to be supported and if they are supported then all of us do better moving away from striving it's great to get things done it's great to be productive it's great to have goals but can we balance that out with being it's not all about the doing we can also just be so ruth king uh, who wrote mindful of race transforming racism from the inside out i love how she talks about we need to start with ourselves we cannot start by pointing the finger at all the other people who we think could do better they probably can do better but we can be role models by work, doing our own work. You cannot live in the United States for any amount of time without internalizing racism. My parents who came here when they were 15 and 20, they learned pretty quickly what the rules were, who had privilege and who did not. And they didn't have the African-American upbringing but they understood what it meant to be black. And so we indoctrinate people into that system all the time. We don't have classes about it, but it's so easy to see in the TV shows, in the news cycle, in what is shown and what is never shown. So some of the barriers to talking about race is white people seeing themselves as good individuals rather than part of a group, a collective, that enslaved people for hundreds of years. The murder of George Floyd that was witnessed by so many people was a modern day public lynching. So not everybody calls it a murder. And so that could be a microaggression all by itself. This idea of not acknowledging how this country has had 400 years of oppression of black and brown people in a variety of different ways, subtle and not so subtle ways. So as long as white people can't see themselves as part of a collective, as part of a European American history of oppression in order to build wealth, then it's hard to really have conversations. Looking at all the ways we've internalized oppression and racism, and I don't just mean white people, I also mean black indigenous people of color. This notion that when we internalize it, we behave in those ways. So if I internalize negative images and ideas about black people, then I have some shame about myself and or I start to shame other people or have these ideas about other people, these biases about other people that I buy into. And so that's part of what's so powerful about the white supremacy pyramid, right, is that people police each other. People keep people in line. And silence happens a lot, right? And to be silent is to have some privilege because it, you don't need to speak. Some people are silent, particularly BIPOC individuals and other marginalized identities because that's the way that they survive because their life, physical body is actually in danger versus I feel uncomfortable, but my life is not in danger. And so how do we start to differentiate safety from discomfort? So this idea of stars and constellations. So why was George Floyd's murder so different? I don't think it was different for a lot of Black People. I think it's that cumulative impact of watching video after video of knowing family members and friends and people who look like you being murdered or being treated in ways that embody this three-fifths of a human being, which was a policy of the United States for a long time. So stars versus constellations. So star is this idea that it's a bad apple or a bad cop or a bad teacher or a bad CEO, 
But a constellation says it's the whole orchard, that this was exactly how the system was designed, so how could we expect anything else? We have to move beyond people's good intentions to impact. What's the harm that is done? If people are saying they are hurt by actions, why don't we listen? Why isn't there curiosity about that? So we have the Black Lives Matter movement, which I'll only spend a little bit of time talking about, but this idea that it's not new to 2020. It was started by three queer black women in 2012 as a hashtag to really say that we have loved ones who have experienced mass incarceration due to mental health issues, who have been murdered by police officers. And there's something so much bigger that we have queer, trans, black people who experience a lot of violence and a lot of death. And they are the most vulnerable among us and their lives matter too. It's this idea that we have to make some sort of reparation around all the hundreds of years of white people having a head start, which then creates all these problems in our communities. It, and we have to look at how mass incarceration came from the 13th Amendment, and it's the ways in which racism has continued on a systemic level, but it's called the war on drugs instead. We have to look at the ways communities are over-policed, particularly communities of color. If you're looking for more things, of course you're gonna find more things. And we have to invest in schools serving black children. So when you hear people talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, this is how it started. No matter how it's distorted or how other people are talking about it, this was the original intention. So when we look at um, this groundwater metaphor, it's this idea that we have to stop looking at things as just what's wrong with this person? How is this person at fault? Because when we start to look at numerous people exhibiting the same behavior across many schools, many towns, many jobs, many cities, we have to say that there is something in the foundation that needs to be changed. I'll just share a couple of slides just to show the systemic nature of this. This is the racial wealth divide in the United States. This is from 2013, which shows the vast difference in economic resources available to the median household. That we see that black and Hispanic households combined, there's a $100,000 gap. And so this, Right, we can have lots of different stories about why that is. Is it that white people are smarter, they work harder? Um, is it that black people in Hispanic households are lazy, they're not as intelligent? Or is there something much more, right? Is it that these white households have had more access to things, education, resources. They've had hundreds of years of head start, so wealth passes down through families and generations, that they were able to own a home in a good neighborhood or something that their homes were valued, which was different for these households. And we really see in COVID the impact of not being able to work for a period of time. And all of this then impacts school districts and property taxes and resources. We add the Asian population into this and we see that that model minority uh, designation has its privileges and has its stressors. And even with that, there is a huge wealth gap there. And that the model minority myth, you know, leads to a lot of suicidality and shame in various cultures, but also it's in its essence anti-blackness because it's basically saying model minority is you're not black. You're not, we're not, we don't associate you with the qualities that we associate with a black person. And so we see then how easy it is to tell different stories about why this is. We see here um, just like one snapshot of the healthcare system that we see that black women are more likely to die from pregnancy-related deaths than any other racial ethnic groups here. Why is that? 
Is that because of biology? Is that because of the ways in which they're perceived, the care that they get, the bias that nurses and doctors have, the ways in which women have been socialized to talk about themselves? All of these things. We look at school districts and we see that black students are three to four times more likely to be suspended or expelled than white students. And why is that? Is it that individual or is there something systemic? Are there implicit biases that are here? So we're we can choose to be actively anti-racist and confront inherent anti-blackness in education or we can choose to sustain it. Those are our choices. So I invite you to take a moment to stop and check in with yourself and notice what's happening in your body as you're hearing this stuff. What do you wanna push away? What are you willing to be curious about? What's your social location as you're hearing this stuff? What's your racial ethnic identity? What's your professional identity? And we have to always do a power analysis. We have to identify where am I in this social identity? Am I the one from the oppressed group? Am I the one from doing the oppressing? Even if I individually am not doing it, but my social identity group is. Because that, we have different responsibilities, right? As a, as a Black person from, tends to be in the oppressed group as a group, right? That I challenge myself to speak up when it is safe, physically safe for me, I challenge myself to speak up and take that anti-racist stance. And if I was white identifying, then my challenge is to not be defensive, to take the information and to be curious, to see what is the truth within what I am hearing, to not challenge it, to not explain it, to not ask for people to give you evidence of that being true. So many of you have seen this becoming anti-racist thing of, it really starts with dealing with fear. We're tribal people who want to fit in, to be connected, to be loved, to be cared for. And so there can be a lot of fear about being uncomfortable, learning new things, and then owning our privilege and using that privilege to make changes. And regardless of if you have a lot of power in where you work or a little power, what you do matters. So there are these ideas of, from Keith Edwards, Dr. Keith Edwards about how people move along on allyship. That oftentimes it starts from a place of self-interest, right? That we have children who are BIPOC identifying, we have a spouse, a friend, a loved one, and so we don't wanna see them suffer anymore. And so we're just focused on like, how do we help that person or their immediate vicinity, our circle of influence. And then as we develop in this process, we start to say, okay, like it's, it's not just these people I love, but it's like all these BIPOC people, or if we're talking about sexual orientation, it's all these LGB, um, this whole group, right? That they need better, they need policies to change. And then as we continue to develop, we take on the social justice model, which says that I'm focused on this issue. Right, so I am focused on mass incarceration and the fact that I don't think that people should be incarcerated for drug related crimes that could be dealt with by treatment or by addressing what causes people to use those drugs or sell those drugs. And so I'm focused on the issue and I realize that I am impacted. I lose out by us incarcerating millions of people for nonviolent crimes. And that I want there to be a, a, a culture of res restoration, a restorative justice versus punitive and shaming. And so I start to use my privilege to try to change the system or to rebuild the system. So I just like this picture of this idea of we are always evaluating what our biases are that we have learned. It's not bad to have biases. We all have them. But are we willing to do the work to start to really look at it on a daily basis? So um, I've adapted this, which looks at like, what are the different kinds of organizational cultures? 
So we have the uh, all white club, which is how it all started in this country. Right, and it's made by white people, often cis people. Some professions, I think, have, are a little bit more female dominated at this point. Um, decisions tend to be made in private ways that people can't see or really know. Um, it's the organization tends to be located in primarily um, white suburban or affluent areas, and decorations tend to reflect a predominantly white culture or neutrality. Um, it tends to be pretty top down and paternalistic. And then we start to see you can have then a token or affirmative action organization, a multicultural organization, or an anti racist organization. And we really start to see the difference. Right? Um, that I think for a long time we, we've done token or affirmative action organizations. Right? And so we see how the culture of these different organizations, right? Um, top down is the all white club. Um, token or affirmative action, it's still top down, but there's a sense that inclusivity is more, it is valued. But conflict is still avoided in affirmative action organizations, right? And leadership at the top is still primarily white. Then we move to a multicultural organization where organization looks inclusive because their, their makeup of their team is probably more diverse, meaning it's diverse from whiteness. Uh, there's more of an active celebration of diversity. Um, there's a focus on reducing prejudice, but it's uncomfortable naming racism. There's assumption that there's a level playing field in a multicultural organization. Workaholism is desired and rewarded. Right, uh, it's still uncomfortable with conflict. And then a true anti-racist organization actively recruits and mentors BIPOC individuals, celebrates diversity, has a power analysis about racism and other oppression issues. There's a diversity of work styles encouraged with active reflection about balancing what gets done and, and how it gets done. A willingness to name racism and address conflict and to to put a stand out there of what they will and will not tolerate and related to racism. Resources are de devoted to helping people and mentoring them. There's an assumption there is an 11 level playing field. Some people, some people didn't have access to certain training and education. Um, and the location is in places that embrace more of what your client population is. So supervisors have a lot of power and privilege to, to deliberately initiate conversations about cultural diversity and decide if they want to take an anti-racist stance. So just some ideas is that we have to acknowledge that we don't live in a colorblind society. If you are focused on colorblindness, then there's some privilege there. We have to, these are all the ways in which anti-racism can show up because anti-racism also is inclusive of neurodiversity. It's inclusive of this idea of us using our pronouns, right? Mine are she, her, hers. That's how I introduce myself, that we don't want to put the onus on people who have to out themselves because we've misgendered them. That we don't want to use the bias of my brain says, oh, you meet these characteristics, so I assume you are this gender that we want different styles of working, different cultures, different ways of communicating, that we want all of that welcome, that that is true anti-racism. And anti-racism is this challenge of racist policies and racist ideas. So I think about like, where are you on your journey, right? That people in the innermost circle of this concentric circle, they already think of themselves as anti-racist. They know that this is an active process for the rest of their life. Then the next set circle is those who sort of get it, their allies that kind of come in and out of this stuff. Um, then the next circle out is those who, you know, I would say are like moderates, like they're just living their life. Um, they think about this stuff here and there, maybe when it pops up on their news feed, but it's not something central to that, to their lives in terms of activity that they're using to challenge the status quo. And then those on the outermost circle, they're those who are actively resisting this idea of racism, this idea of 
there needing to be more equity or reparations. They believe that racism doesn't really exist in their communities or in their jobs or in their school districts. So I always think about like when I'm talking to people, where are they in these circles? Because I'm in the innermost circle and I'm probably not going to spend a whole lot of energy talking to people in the outermost circles um, because I kind of think that they're not really interested um, and I don't want to do that much labor. But the people who are in, the be in between, there's lots of possibility there. But we can't shame people into changing. We have to be curious. My mentor often says, I speak not to change others, but rather to heal myself. And so if I'm not trying to change people, then I can enter the conversation with a little bit more ease. So how do we invite people in versus calling them out? First, we start with affirming what's good and what's shared, right? Like see their full humanity. You know, we all make mistakes, right? And can I approach this conversation from a place of vulnerability, of where I am in the struggle, of mistakes I've made, of things that I used to think, of things that I'm still wrestling with, this new book I read, this documentary I saw, this book club I was in. Can I start try to seek understanding of their point of view and where they're coming from and what they're exposed to? Can I thank them for having the conversation, maybe invite them to a workshop? And can I ta take time to think about like, what's coming up for me that has me so fired up? So these are just many of the things one can do to become anti-racist or continue with anti-racism is talk, learn, sit in discomfort, talk to your children at a very early age and then ongoing. It shouldn't be the onus only on BIPOC families to have the talk with their children. Right, that if we all have the talk, maybe we don't have to have the talk in generations to come. Start to examine anti-Blackness culture in all the places that it exists. Read different sources and authors, support Black-owned businesses, support BIPOC businesses, lift up the voices of BIPOC individuals, let them do it their way. Let's not police what they're saying, how they're saying it. Use your privilege to make space for them. If they're not in the room, know enough to be able to lift them up and represent them or invite them into the room. Remember that racism isn't binary. We're all conditioned in white supremacy. Hold space for rage. Rage is grief that cannot be expressed. It's the accumulation of death by a thousand little cuts. Work to have desegregate your work environment, your, your living environment. Look at all the intersectionality of identities. Reach out to your local police departments, your local legislation and Congress people. It starts in our local communities, back to that pyramid, the bottom of that pyramid. So this was just a taste, right? If you want to dive in more, I have two different anti-racism resource pages on my drnatedmond.com, which tends to be geared more for therapists. And then the mmcounselingcenter.com, which has just a, a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, there's great stuff in both. And um, I've created an assessment for you to take on the drnatedmond.com website. So you can just assess what are some areas you are still growing edges for you. I encourage you to take that, invite your friends to take it. Might be a great starting point for our conversation. I'm holding another anti-racism 1.0 series that starts October 5th, it's Monday evening, three weeks, and we dive deep into this content. And then I have a 2.0 series for people who've already done the 1.0 series or some equivalent, and we dive even deeper. There's online videos that I've recorded, um, welcome to purchase. Schedule an individual coaching or consultation call with me because you already know where you want to go in your organization. You want to organize a training for your staff. You're a yoga teacher and you want to learn more about trauma-sensitive yoga from an anti-racist lens. That's the first weekend in October. Or if you're like, I just don't know where to even begin, schedule a consultation call with me and we'll talk about what comes next. Let's see what's in the chat box. Uh, if there were any um, 
questions that people wanted to ask. We have a couple, we have a couple of minutes. Um, happy to, um, if you want to type them into the chat box, um, happy to address them. I see, where would the advantage of receiving the best, worst interpretation for your actions fit in this pyramid? Hmm. I wonder, Mike, if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, you can get my contact info at uh, drnatedmond.com. That will have my email stuff. Uh, Dr. Edmond, were you referring to the question about um, interpretation? Uh, there was something that says, where would the advantage of receiving the best, worst interpretation for your actions fit in this pyramid? Yes, so I, I've been noticing, you know, as, as I'm learning a lot about, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, that um, interpretations of one's actions is, um, it's, it, it's either a microaggression or a macroaggression. And I'm just wondering where that fits in terms of um, the different levels of uh, the pyramid that you showed us. Um, is it, uh, you know, an example of supremacy? Um, is it an example of a microaggression? Can you give an example of an instance? Yeah, uh, okay, so um, let's talk about uh, the way someone dresses, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I feel like um, if I show up at work and I'm not wearing a tie and a shirt, um, it might be more noticeable than if a colleague of mine does. Um, and I feel like that I, I have to be, I have, 